A thousand years before and after Jesus, a small collection of writings found their way into the sacred scriptures of Jews and Christians. To this day, this small library of ancient writings is accepted by many as the Word of God. But there were hundreds of religious writings considered important at the time that were left out of the Holy Bible. What is contained in these rejected books and why were they left out? Some of this forbidden material, a lot of it comes from the Gnostic groups. Were some writings thought too fanciful? Where is the story coming from? What kind of a community does the story arise out of? Is this an old traditional Christian community? Perhaps these excluded or banned books were simply deemed unworthy for inclusion in sacred scripture. Some of them were decided to be rather suspicious and perhaps of questionable influence. And so there is a collection of books that we would say are literally forbidden. The story of the Forbidden Bible begins some 150 years after the birth of Jesus. It was an obscure figure in history, a man named Marcion, who became the unlikely catalyst for a Christian version of the Holy Bible. He was a man of great wealth and strong convictions. Marcion of Pontus was called the Mus Ponticus, the Pontic Rat. Uh, he was a church leader who was a very wealthy individual. He owned his own ship. He was involved in the shipping industry. And he not only was very wealthy, but he had some very strict theological points of view. He was a Bible-believing, Bible-thumping Christian who believed everything that he thought was Christian in the Bible. But when he looked at the Jewish Bible, what he saw there startled him and appalled him because he was very literalistic in his reading. And so he took a look at the Jewish Bible and he thought he saw a God there who was harsh and vindictive and legalistic. And Marcion said, that's not the God that I believe in. Marcion was convinced that the God of the Hebrew Bible was not the God taught by Jesus. Without any church authority, Marcion created his own Christian Bible. Hebrew scripture, what Christians call the Old Testament, was banned in this book. The only writings he considered worthy were Luke's Gospel, with all references to the Old Testament erased, and Paul's letters. Considering what Marcion did, it's no wonder that one of his opponents said, shame on Marcion's eraser. Marcion wanted very badly to be accepted as a great church leader, and one day he met somebody who was very well known, uh, and he came up to the person and he said, don't you recognize who I am? And this other church leader turned to Marcion and said, yes, you're the firstborn of Satan. In spite of his notoriety among second century Christian leaders, Marcion's basic idea took hold. The new Christian religion should have a Bible to call its own. The church fathers of Marcion's day began to create lists, books they believed had to be included in a Christian Bible, and books that should be left out. There was no shortage of material. Some of these individual writings had been circulating separately and randomly within Christian communities, large and small, since the end of the first century. The four Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, the Epistles of Timothy and Titus, and the letters of the Apostle Paul. These were personal letters. They were occasional letters that addressed the needs in the various churches. And if Paul had any idea what people would do with his letters in terms of theologizing on the basis of them, he would have been a whole lot more careful when he wrote them. By the year 150 A.D., hundreds of manuscripts were being written by the emerging Christian leaders and theologians throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. But another century would pass without an officially recognized Bible. Then, on October 28, 312, everything changed. A 
man named Constantine had a vision of a cross in the sky as he prepared to do battle for the city of Rome. Legend has it that Jesus spoke to him in a vision saying, in my name, conquer. The following day, he won the battle, defeated the superior force of Maxentius, his rival, and became the sole emperor of Rome. It was the vision of this cross and the victory that followed that fueled Constantine's newfound interest in the Christian faith. The pagan civilization that had overseen the crucifixion of Jesus was about to adopt the faith it once tried to destroy. Constantine as emperor had a number of things he was dealing with. He was a shrewd politician, a statesman, a diplomat, a warrior, but he realized that he needed to have some order and some unity in the empire. And that order and unity could come through at least having some religion uh, or some religious purpose that could bring all people together because religion could be something that could unite the empire. The Near East at the time of Constantine was a massive conglomeration of different perspectives, different peoples, different races, different religions. It really was a very mixed situation. There were differing Jewish groups. There was a diversity of Christian groups. There was all kinds of dialogue going on. You have the little Christian church on one end of the corner. You have the pagan worship on the other end of the corner. People go where they want to go, but at the same time they have questions about what door you're walking into. And then you have the contentions within each of these communities about what's the proper way to worship. There were in the early church a wide variety of ways of being Christian. One could be a Jewish Christian, one could be a Gentile Christian, one could be more Gnostic in one's point of view, one could be very mystical, one could be rather legalistic. Even so, a battle was raging in the early churches. Arius, a monastic from the city of Alexandria, believed that Jesus was the highest created being, but he was not God. In vehement opposition to this opinion,